Hello and welcome to another edition of Currently in Quincy. I'm Joe Catalano. And on today's program, we'll chat with Quincy School Superintendent Kevin Mulvey. First, though, we check news for you. Currently in Quincy, there were six new cases of coronavirus confirmed in Quincy as of yesterday, bringing the active case total to 35. But Quincy remains in the green category under the state's risk assessment map. The death toll stands at 135. The Quincy City Council has approved spending another $14 million for a new special education center on Old Colony Avenue. Officials voted 8-1 to one this week in favor of the mayor's request to borrow the funds to create that new center at a building the city purchased from Eastern Nazarene College last year. Councilor at large Ann Mahoney voted against the expenditure, citing concerns about the city's future finances due to the pandemic. But Ward 4 Councilor Brian Pamucci explained that the city can afford the project now and can deal with any future financial problems later. So it's prudent fiscal policy to, to bond, to borrow money to build those projects. But what the what the fiscal policy, prudent fiscal policy requires is that we know what our debt will be for for the for the future. And it, and it needs to stay at a, at a set percentage of our budget. And as our budget increases, the, the debt percentage and well, the debt percentage will stay the same. But the debt amount that we can pay in will increase. The money we have to pay the debt will increase. Therefore, we could borrow more. So as our budget has expanded, our ability to borrow money has expanded. And we have been able to uh, undertake more larger projects to benefit the whole city than we have in the past, in, the pa in this 10 years and in the, in the prior 10 years. And I suspect in the 10 years moving forward, we'll do even more. So while the COVID-19 uh, pandemic will undoubtedly affect our budget, we still will face the same issues, whether we approve this project or not, from the COVID-19. It's not as if uh, this is going to be some bill that comes out that no one anticipated and it's going to completely break the budget it is still built into that debt service so if you have to cut if you have to cut spending across the board uh, and no one's suggesting that at this point by the way no one's suggesting that at all um if you have to cut spending across the board by two percent you cut your debt service level by two percent as well as um, other areas that you can cut by two percent if it's across the board right we still have room to do that because we have debt coming off, uh, we have the ability to, to uh, hold off on spending after that point if there's a problem. Right now, we do not have a problem. Perhaps we will. Perhaps we'll have to do some belt tightening. But as it stands now, we are still in a position to continue to move the city forward with positive projects that benefit the quality of life of the residents. City Council previously approved $8.5 million to purchase and renovate the building, bringing the total cost of the project to $22.5 million. The project could take up to two years to complete. A new radio communications tower will be needed for the Quincy Police and Fire Departments once the former Quincy Medical Center is torn down. The administration is seeking $3.65 million to build the new tower near the new dog park on Quarry Street. Mayor Thomas Koch's spokesman Chris Walker says the new system has been a long time coming. It's there and functioning as a hospital. It was functioning under uh, different private owners at the time and still maintaining City of Quincy equipment. So I think even dating well before uh, any more recent discussions about the future use of the site, not even as a hospital, but even dating back, um, you know, 10, a dozen uh, years ago with the uh, hospital under private control under different owners, I think it was always in uh, the back of uh, folks' mind, both in the administration level and the police department and the fire department, that ultimately, yes, we were going to have to find a new location for that. Walker said the new system is needed not only because the former hospital is coming down, where the equipment is now, but also because the system is old and outdated. The Finance Committee is reviewing that request. Every Quincy City Council meeting will begin with a special recognition to a city department, community group, or individual who has worked to benefit the city. Council President Nina Liang said the idea was to offer thanks and appreciation, especially during these troubled times. This past week, it was the Quincy Police Department 
and Quincy first responders who were thanked for their service during the pandemic. Police Chief Paul Keenan was grateful for the honor. It's been the most interesting and challenging time that I've faced, I know personally and also professionally. I know the men and women of the Quincy Police Department have stepped up to the plate uh, on a daily basis through all of this. They've come to work, they've done what they're asked to do, they've done it without reservation, they have put themselves in harm's way. And I know that they really appreciate the support that they've received from our city council, from our mayor, from our local uh, delegates. Um, they're, they're very, very appreciative of that. And I know it goes a long way in challenging times, especially for morale. The morale at the Quincy Police Department, I believe, is still very, very high, even though we've been challenged like everybody else has for the last six or eight months. We still come to work. These people, I see them out in the backyard in the roll call rooms, and outside at roll call. And they've got smiles on their faces, they're laughing and joking, and then they go out about their business and go about taking care of the citizens of Quincy. And I'm very, very proud, and I've always been a proud to be a police officer, and I'm proud to be the chief of such a great department with all these excellent men and women that are really doing all the right things. And Liang encouraged the public to watch future city council meetings for more recognition presentations. The next meeting is October 5th. Coming up, we will chat with newly appointed Quincy School Superintendent Kevin Mulvey next. We're all coming together again to learn this fall. And we all have a role to play to keep our community healthy. This also means kids should stay at home if they're not feeling well. If we all do our part, our schools and communities will be safer for everyone. Learn more at mass.gov slash back to school. I hear someone go, didn't it come from you guys? Strangers cough at me. Move away from me. Someone spit towards my direction. All the stereotypes that we've worked so hard to break are just going to be reversed. And I won't let that happen. We all have to play our part. I donate my plasma. I've been making masks. We deserve respect as much as everybody else. I'm a firefighter, not a virus. I'm a mask maker, not a virus. I'm a nurse. I'm a delivery woman. A chef. A neighbor. Artist. Bus driver. I'm a doctor. Fight the virus. Fight the virus. Or do you know a veteran who is struggling with housing due to COVID-19? Veterans Inc. can help provide support services, including assistance with rent, deposits, utilities, as well as emergency housing, including hotel stays to eligible struggling veterans. If you or someone you know is in need of services, please call 1-800-482-2565 or go online to www.veteransinc.org. So we're really pleased to welcome for the first time, but hopefully not the last, to the uh, program, newly appointed Quincy School Superintendent Kevin Mulvey. Mr. Mulvey, so great to uh, virtually see you. Thanks so much. Great, for to see you too. great to see you too, Joe. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure, and uh, we look forward to uh, making this a uh, semi-regular event. Um, if that's all right, your predecessor was a frequent guest here at QATV. Absolutely. Anytime, I'll be happy to come over and see you, or we'll do it remotely, but hopefully in person soon. Correct. Yeah, I hope so um, as well. It's, it makes for a, a totally different experience. Um, but thankfully, we have this in, in the meantime, um, as Quincy Public School students do too, right? At least uh, for, for part of the time. How's, yes. uh, how's the reopening going? So the re reopening is going well. Um, we have um, obviously started our phase one, which is um, our students pre-K to three and all of our high need students. Uh, on September 16th. So that really is an invite to half of our student population of 10,000. So we have essentially invited uh, about 5,000 students back to school. Um, some students are electing to stay remotely, which is obviously um, their right to do. And um, we understand that um, considering all of the um, individual safety um, concerns that individual families may have, not only with their own students, but with family members living in the same household that may be at high risk, so on and so forth, things like that. So we 
we understand that decision. Uh, we do have um, a good amount of students that have decided to return uh, in person under the high needs model, as well as the hybrid model for um, pre-K to three. So that's great. And uh, next phase uh, will begin for grades four through 12 on October 13th. And we're looking forward to that as well. Is that pretty comparable to what other um, quote unquote green communities are doing um, according to the metrics? Um, actually, I, I would, um, would have hoped to have seen actually more communities who are in the green um, follow the hybrid approach that we're following, but there are a number of communities that still remain in the green that have not actually acted upon a hybrid or in-person model just yet. Um, I know in, um, in meeting with actually the governor earlier today, there are 16 communities in Massachusetts who have been solidly in the green. Uh, uh, or even better than that in the gray that have decided not to return yet. But I know they're working with them to try and uh, get them to come back to school because I think everyone agrees there really is uh, no um, better mode of education than in-person education. So I think that's what we're all trying to uh, trying to get to as quickly as possible. So, Yeah, I had a, actually a chance to, to watch that um, uh, forum with, with the governor and um, with the um, assistant superintendent as well, um, Aaron yeah. Perkins. How was it that, uh, that Quincy was singled out as, as a model? So um, Quincy, we were actually invited to um, the governor's press conference for two reasons. One, because of the uh, model program we did over the summer with regard to our special education programs at both uh, North Quincy High School and ECC. Um, so that was a in-person program for our special needs students, our most vulnerable high needs students. Uh, and we were able to successfully run that program throughout the summer. And the response we got from parents and students was really enthusiastic and very positive. Um, so we were very happy with that. Um, we did actually go through a time, though, where we did have a positive case of a staff member at that program, as you probably have heard. But because we followed the guidance of the state and also a local guidance with Health Commissioner Ruth Jones, we were, we were able to effectively um, quarantine the staff member, the classroom, while still being able to continue educational services for those students. So. It was essentially a test run for our, our, our fall opening um, so that we, you know, well prepared in the event that we do have future positive cases. Our goal is to be able to deal with those effectively while also maintaining educational programming for our kids. And of course, safety is our number one priority for both staff and students. So. Yeah, I'm aware there was a, um, a student uh, positive at Bernasani earlier this week. How, how was that handled? Yes, so we received word of that on Sunday, and um, we wanted to make sure that um, obviously we followed all proper health and safety protocols. So the first thing we always do is make sure we get in touch with Ruth Jones and go through the protocols with her to make sure that we're all operating on the same page. Um, once we did confirm that there was a positive case uh, of a student, we wanted to make sure that we not only reached out to that student, but we also wanted to make sure that we knew of all of the, um, of the um, contact that the student may have had with other students um, so that we could, if necessary, quarantine other students. Fortunately, we didn't have to quarantine um, all of the class, um, just one student based on social distancing guidelines and uh, the amount of contact that student had with other students. And again, that was under the uh, guidance of um, Ruth Jones. So in that instance, obviously, we contacted the positive case and the, um, the case that had um, high contact with, um, with the positive case and instructed them both to quarantine. We obviously sent out communication to staff and also communication to the community to let them know. And of course, we always want to let the mayor and school committee know as well. So will that be the policy going forward for any uh, positive case? Yes, it will be, unless, of course, we have any type of change from the CDC or from state or local health departments, that would be the policy moving forward. It's a, it's a good policy because it allows us to be, you know, communicate directly with families um, as well as the community just to let them know, you know what the situation is and um, let them know also that we are handling it appropriately per state and uh, local guidelines. 
How is the, I know that the uh, transportation um, is looking a lot different uh, this year due to the pandemic. How is that working out? Yes, it is. So um, as you probably know, as part of the pandemic, the state had issued a number of um, guidelines for our reopening in September. One of those guidelines addressed transportation specifically. And because of the social distancing guidelines that are required for buses, we had to, um, unfortunately, we had to um, expand our um, bus policy or uh, modify our bus policy um, from um, any point beyond 1.5 miles transportation would be provided. We had to expand that to um, beyond two miles and beyond um, because we just did not have the bus fleet or the um, bus drivers to be able to manage the um, the distancing requirements uh, that the state had placed on school districts. So just for an instance, like the big buses that people are familiar with, we would only be able to um, put about 23 students on a big bus. And normally we would um, put probably closer to 50 on a school bus in that case. And a smaller bus, a mini buses, um, they could fit anywhere normally between 16 and 20, maybe more and we were limited to um, uh, six students on a mini bus. And of course that gets reduced uh, when we have to put a monitor on the bus, for instance. So, um, so based on those distancing guidelines, we really had to expand that 1.5 out to two miles. Um, but um, you know, aside from that, um, all of the students are getting to school safely and we still are running a transportation program for those students that live two miles and beyond. Um, and we also, um, of course, are running our transportation program for our special education students as well. And that's running very smoothly at the moment. So you anticipate uh, that will be that way for a while. It's not an issue now with the beautiful weather, but uh, as things change uh, and <laughs> the winter approaches, that could be an issue. It could very well be an issue. So the key here is obviously to work hand in hand with the, our families and making sure that they are supported. Uh, our number one priority is the safety of our students. So if there are any concerns, we will work with those families um, to make sure that the students are arriving to school on time. I think everyone agrees that we want, you know, COVID-19 to go away and everything to return to normal as quickly as possible. Um, so, but until that happens, we do have to follow these safety guidelines, but I do want families to know that we'll work with them to make sure that their students arrive to school safely. Okay. Can we talk just a little bit about um, academics? Just curious um, if the curriculum for the hybrid learning model is any different than it would have been for in-person learning. So um, this obviously it'll be a, a little bit different at each level, elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, but generally speaking, the curriculum itself um, will be very similar to the curriculum you would have in a normal school year. Um, so the curriculum, although the curriculum may not change, the scheduling and the on-time learning may be uh, a bit different. Um, so at the elementary school, um, the curriculum and even the scheduling would be very close to a normal school day um, because we're able to, uh, based on health and safety guidelines, cohort each class into, um, into their individual classes. So for instance, uh, we won't have any uh, traveling of um, obviously at the elementary level um, students from one classroom to another or even one or even going from class to gym or to music or to any of these other academic programs or art for instance. Uh, we'll be bringing all of those programming into the classroom so that students can remain cohorted in the classroom to minimize intermingling of that cohort with any other students. Again, that's per um, DZ guidelines and per um, the local and state health department guidelines as well. We're also gonna be bringing in lunch into the classrooms as well. Um, and our food service uh, director, Sarah Dufour and her assistant, uh, Ms. Minton have been doing a great job um, because not only are they preparing for in-person food service, they also are um, continuing to provide food for those students who have elected to stay home remotely. Mm -hmm. So I think since March, we have served over 120,000 lunches and breakfasts to uh, kids throughout the city. And they've really done a great job. I have to thank our entire food service staff, um, all of the food service workers in all the schools because they're 
they're the frontline workers making sure that our kids are getting fed and they're uh, making sure um, that um, every family that comes to the school seeking a breakfast or a lunch definitely gets it. Um, so that's just one example of what's happening at the elementary school. At middle school, it becomes a little more challenging because obviously there is typically more movement at the middle school because kids usually move subject to subject. Again, at the middle school, we're trying to keep our students more cohorted to minimize intermingling with other students. Similar to elementary school, we'll be bringing everything to the classroom. Um, so all of the specialists will be coming to the classes. Uh, the individual teachers uh, teaching the different subjects will be coming into the classroom rather than students traveling. And then of course, same thing with lunch. Lunch will be served in the um, classroom as well. Okay. Um, High school under the hybrid plan is really where it gets extremely challenging. And we have 11 days to go, but we are still um, continuing to work on the hybrid plan for the high school. And the reason is because of all the different subjects at the high school um, and obviously the, um, uh, the number of teachers that are at the high school too in order to serve our students. So um, we have developed a number of hybrid plans. We had proposed one last night that we're streamlining even more. Uh, we proposed it last night to the school committee. Um, but the, the, um, the problem with the hybrid plan is we have to run both a remote school and an in-person school with the same amount of staff. Um, because um, obviously we can't double our staff because budgetarily it's, uh, it wouldn't be feasible. So we have to be really inventive with regard to how we're going to be covering all of these classes because we do want as much uh, live in-person instruction for the in-person kids, but we also want live synchronous instruction for the remote students. So that's going to be a real challenge, but we're committed to get it done. And um, we're going to give our students the best possible education they can have, even during this COVID-19 crisis. So is it essentially for remote learning, is it essentially um, a computer in the classroom as that class is being taught in person? It's also being taught remotely? So um, again, it'll be different at each level. Okay. Um, so we essentially have, I guess you can take, look, look at it as almost as have, having two schools. We have a hybrid school okay. and we have a remote school. So just focusing on the remote school. Um, so our teachers are, um, will be on their laptop and essentially doing their instruction uh, remotely to our students who may mm -hmm. be at home do, receiving the instruction or they may be at school receiving the instruction if they need, for instance, uh, internet connectivity, uh, or even if they uh, need a device, we are welcoming students into our two high schools, um, some of our middle schools, as well as some of our elementary schools in order to make sure students have that internet connectivity in order to engage in their mm -hmm. online education. Oh, so, um, but we have given out, um, we have given out over 1,300 Chromebooks, and we are expecting another delivery of 2,500 within the next couple of weeks. And so we'll have, and then we're gonna have another delivery of about 4,500 um, the week after that. So we will have plenty of Chromebooks within the next couple of weeks for students to have uh, if they wish to continue their remote instruction from home but certainly if they wish to come into school, they're more than welcome to, and we will provide them a space. Okay. How are report cards going to look uh, <laughs> this year, Kevin? How is that, how is it yeah. cheap going to be measured? Yeah. So yeah, report cards will definitely um, be a challenge, but again, we're committed to making it as normal a report card uh, process as possible for our families. So all of our principals and our superintendent's leadership team are working very hard to make sure that um, the report card process, as I said, will be very similar to what they have seen in the past. So I know that um, in cooperation with our union, um, we're using, um, our teachers will be using either Google Classroom or Aspen to um, chronicle their grades, which is a great asset to us. Again, um, luckily for our uh, technology advancement, um, it has like it has really helped with regard to dealing with this COVID crisis, even with you and I talking here. Um, similarly, with the technology that we have, we're able to 
um, advance certain areas that we normally wouldn't be able to advance, and that includes the report cards and grading in general. So our goal with regard to just grading in general is to make sure that teachers are posting uh, their grades regularly online and parents can have access to that, again, either through the Aspen uh, software system or the Google Classroom software system so that the idea is there won't be any surprises so that parents can monitor their students progress during remote or hybrid learning and they'll know they'll know exactly how they're doing during that process yes. and then of course the grading at the end will will be um, you know will will also be there for uh, students and families. Yeah. Okay. In some ways, um, it, it's actually more interactive uh, this way than it would have been a traditional year for at least to keep an eye on uh, students' progress. Absolutely. Yes. So in some ways, it's a silver lining because we're kind of advancing into that 21st century educational classroom where everything is more interactive and more hands-on and students and families have uh, greater control and greater um, ability to monitor student progress than they have in the past. Right, yeah. You mentioned the union. I know there was some concern about um, ventilation in some of the school buildings. Has that uh, come been, been resolved? So we are uh, working out those issues still. We have uh, resolved all other outstanding issues with regard to putting together a memorandum of agreement with the union. Um, we have a draft, I think, 13-page document at the moment uh, which covers everything that you can imagine in regard to remote learning and hybrid learning. Uh, the last sticking point is the uh, ventilation system issue, and we'll continue to work with our union to resolve those concerns. And I know that the public buildings department and um, David Scott, our the city's mechanical engineer, has been working or literally around the clock to get all of our buildings up to um, up to speed with regard to ventilation. I do have to thank Mr. Scott and Paul Hines, the commissioner his team and the mayor for putting in the funding and the time to prioritize our schools to get our ventilation systems where they need to be. And we're very grateful for that. And, um, you know, according to Mr. Hines, uh, Mr. Hines and Mr. Scott and Ruth Jones, our buildings are very safe and um, it pose no risk at all to our students or our staff. Curious, are you able to offer um, some of the vocational uh, programs, um, uh, auto shop, woodworking, uh, culinary arts, things of that nature? Yeah. So at the moment, we are um, still in phase one um, in full. So we're doing fully remote for those programs. But we, what we've done with those chapter 70 program, chapter 74 programs, as they're called, we've front loaded the classroom time uh, to the beginning of remote learning. So that would have all of the, um, uh, the non hands on classroom work would be done remotely now so that when we do phase into phase two on October 13th and we begin the hybrid approach, we'll be able to um, phase in the hands-on programming that's desperately needed for chapter 74 programs. And so that will certainly be available for students if they wish to participate. And obviously if they wish to remain remote, that's certainly their right to do that per state guidance. Um, but we do want families to know that those interested, those students interested in Chapter 74 programs, including culinary, plumbing, carpentry, electrical, that sort of thing, will be available uh, hands-on for our students once the Phase 2 begins on October 13th. Okay. I know that uh, athletics obviously looks a lot different. I think, uh, I think golf started today, actually. Um, it did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, will there be in-person actual competitions? Um, so right now we're, we're, we're uh, waiting on um, the, there will be pretend obviously golf is one of those uh, sports where the ability to have high contact is lessened. So that's why they've allowed golf to begin today. And obviously they, I, I don't see why they, they wouldn't be able to have uh, tournaments in that regard. I, uh, based on state guidance, I think that that will be um, fine and uh, approved. The uh, issue is with regard to the high contact sports like football and soccer, um, uh, basketball, um, wrestling, for instance. So, you know, the um, state is looking to actually move those programs or the start of those programs to f February, mm -hmm. and we'll see how that goes. Um, but we are and we get, you know, guidance from the state almost weekly on this issue. And I know that because of the remote nature of uh, remote uh, learning and hybrid learning, there is the component, the social emotional component that we have to worry about 
relative to our students' well-being. And so we really do want to get these extracurricular activities up and running for our students so that they will have an outlet uh, to socialize and to get outside and get fresh air and exercise. And our athletic programs are really the best way to do that. And so I'm hoping that, um, you know, we'll be able to run uh, some of these programs, even some of the, you know, the tier two or tier three programs as soon as possible so that our students can get involved in these extracurricular activities and obviously do it safely. Sure. Um, so another uh, area that we've been working with the city on in relation to getting more extracurricular activities for our students is working with the uh, recreation department under Commissioner Murphy and um, and uh, his staff in the recreation department, Michelle Hanley. Um, and they're putting together a after school program for our students starting mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, three o'clock on at four school locations so that our students have some extracurricular options there as well. I think on Wednesdays, they'll be offering it at uh, one o'clock for the half day school. So mm -hmm. we're very grateful to them. It really has, the community really has come together with regard to supporting our, our students. And this is just one example of that. And the social emotional needs of our students, we have to take very seriously. And these are all positive, um, positive moves we can make in order to benefit students in that area. Obviously, um, your superintendency is getting off to uh, quite a, a landmark start with the pandemic. But let me ask you, Kevin, if there were no pandemic in a perfect world, um, what would your priorities be right now as you, you know, assume the head of the Quincy Public Schools? Yep. So what my, my approach is pandemic or no pandemic. We are going to be moving forward regardless of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the crisis. So um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do with the um, putting aside the crisis, which will take up a lot of our time. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the other initiatives that we're, we have here in Quincy that are very, very exciting. We have the Learning Center um, that was just approved by the City Council, a $14 million project to benefit all of our um, special needs students here in the city of Quincy. And I have to say that project is so exciting because we're going to reconnect families who, because of the special needs of their students, had to leave the city for educational purposes and reconnect them back to their community. And that is the most exciting part of this building because uh, families and students now will become reintegrated back into the Quincy Public Schools, whereas before they weren't able to do that. And um, the program itself I'm hoping that the um, plans will be unveiled soon for people to see. It's so exciting. The, the work that has been done by Wesley Architects and Paul Hines uh, from the building department and all the other stakeholders, Assistant Superintendent Aaron Perkins, whose expertise is in special education, and myself have been working on putting the plans together for the Learning Center, and it, uh, it is going to be really transformative for our special education community, particularly for our students with autism. Um, it, it really is going to be a top-notch first-class program for those students and Quincy is very lucky to have it. And so that's just one example. We have the Squantum Ele Elementary School we have to keep pursuing. We want to make sure that that building um, gets the proper funding from the school building authority and obviously we'll be doing everything we can do to try and get that funding as soon as possible. Uh, this year would be great and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that so that we can uh, build the needed new school out in Squantum, and it is needed uh, very greatly. So we're hoping that we can make advances on that. Um, and um, we also want to address the not only social emotional concerns of our students, but also focusing in on equity, diversity, and inclusion um, across the district, not only in our curriculum, but also in our hiring practices uh, and try and increase the uh, the number of um, minority applicants and minority hires for, for our schools so that our staff uh, can be and is reflective of the students that we're serving. So that's another initiative that we're working on. Uh, we've partnered with Visions Inc. Um, who have currently they're doing professional development for all of our staff so that we have a, um, 
a, a better handle on how to actually advance um, the goals of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we're confident that we'll be able to do that effectively this year as well. So there are just that's just a few initiatives that we're going to keep moving forward with. There are so many more, but those are the exciting ones, um, and we'll be doing that while also handling the COVID-19 crisis as well. So, oh, is that all? <laughs> that's it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For um, you know, for parents, uh, for guardians who are 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 concerned um, about the quality of education their children are getting during this COVID era, they may be worried that there there be an achievement gap in, in years ahead. What what's your message to them? So my message is for them is we're going to be the school the Quincy School Department is going to be doing everything in its power to make sure that we close that achievement gap. Uh, we're, all, we're looking at achievement gaps now because of COVID-19 across the board. Um, prior to COVID-19, we were looking at achievement gaps for low-income students, for EL students, for uh, students of color. Um, now we have an achievement gap that not only affects them even greater than they were, achieved, they were affected before, but now we're having an achievement gap that's affecting every student. And so our goal here in the Quincy Public Schools is to give our students the absolute best educational opportunity to make sure that number one, there is no achievement gap, or if there is an achievement gap, we close it as quickly as we possibly can by giving students the opportunity to engage in um, various uh, programming, educational programming that will help assist them uh, in overcoming this crisis. And the, for instance, the summer program that we did um, not only for the special education program, but we also did a full remote uh, program for all students across the board. We had 2000, over 2,300 students participate in the summertime in that program. And that program was designed to actually um, deal with the effects of and um, assuage the effects of, the, of COVID-19 and the loss of educational time so that we, can, we could close the gap um, and get our students ready for the next school year. And we certainly hope that we'll be able to do that again this summer. But even during the school year, we will be working with families um, pretty much on a one-on-one -on -one basis and identifying those students who are struggling, reaching out to those students and families, asking them what, what else we can do to assist them and do whatever it takes to make sure that they're successful here in Quincy. So much uh, to talk about. We'd love to have you uh, back at some point uh, in the near future, if you'd be open to that. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Anytime I'll be back. For yeah. folks who uh, have questions, concerns, would like to reach out, what are some good ways for them to do that? Uh, they can um, email me at Kevin Mulvey at quincypublicschools.com. They can give me a call directly at 617-984-8701. Um, they can contact anyone on our website. Uh, any of the SLT. They can contact their local building principals. Again, everyone is here as a resource for students and families to assist them through this crisis and making sure that their students are getting the best possible education they can get in Quincy. And we're committed to that. So don't hesitate to reach out if you need anything in that regard. All right. Really appreciate your time, Mr. Mulvey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Special thanks to Quincy School Superintendent Kevin Mulvey for joining us today. Thanks to our crew and thank you for watching. And a reminder, please do participate in the Quincy COVID Memories Project. QATV, the Thomas Crane Public Library, Quincy 400, and the City of Quincy have all teamed up to collect life experiences in Quincy during the pandemic. You can upload your submissions to quincyculturalmemory.com or send them to the Thomas Crane Library. Attention, local history, 40 Washington Street, Quincy, 02169. And an invitation to please visit our website, qatv.org. You'll find our latest programs, news and information, video on demand, live streaming, information about online classes, and much more. 
for all of us here at Quincy Access Television. I'm Joe Catalano. Please stay safe. <laughs>